I am uh, excited about what I've been asked to talk about, uh, which is the Robotarium uh, at Georgia Tech. This is a remotely accessible swarm robotic lab that we uh, really created uh, in order to democratize access to a sharp world-class research lab. Uh, when we did that, we obviously did not know that uh, there was such a thing as COVID-19. Uh, and one of the things that I do want to spend some time talking about is how the Robotarium has been leveraged since middle of March when uh, virtually every researcher on the planet went home. And uh, the Robotarium has actually continued to play a, an important role in all of this in a way that we had not predicted. Uh, so I am going to pivot towards the, the last part of the talk to really discuss kind of remote access instrumentation and experimentation uh, in this kind of new reality that we are, are finding ourselves in. But to, to get started, first of all, I, I wanna, wanna paint a little bit of a mood picture. So this is uh, my lab at Georgia Tech a decade ago or so. These are 12 robots that are doing formation control of various forms. Uh, and uh, this, these kinds of videos are always included in talks given by people like myself, meaning, look, we proved some theorems and here at the end, uh, the robots are moving. Uh, but there's always stuff going on that are not shown in these videos. Around these robots, there are people, grad students and postdocs, standing, making sure that everything is going all right. Uh, there's also a lot of uh, infrastructure around it. In this particular case, we have a motion captioning system. We have uh, other kinds of sensors and cameras. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff not actually shown. And to put it a little crudely, here's the stuff that's not shown. It costs a lot of resources to run and, well, build, run, and maintain a, a world-class research lab in the area of multi-agent robotics in, uh, in particular, but in, in robotics in general. Uh, and uh, the problem with that is there are only a handful of labs globally that really matter uh, in terms of where most of the exciting experiments come out of. Uh, and that is not because there are only a handful or so people with good ideas. Far from it. There are tons of people that are really, really doing excellent work in kind of theoretical multi-agent robotics or simulated multi-agent robotics. But the fact that it requires so much to run and maintain a world-class research lab, it is a barrier to entry. So uh, what I set out to do five plus years ago is really get rid of this barrier. Try to build some kind of system that lets people with good ideas test their ideas uh, without having to incur the costs that come with, uh, with running a lab like this. Uh, while we did that, there are other things that have been irritating me in my lab. Uh, one of the things is we're spending a lot of time duplicating efforts. We're reinventing wheels over and over and over and over again. We're writing the same device drivers or the same path planning algorithms in my lab as in Sertag's lab at, at MIT. Uh, just to pick on Sertag who, uh, who was on the screen just a, a few slides ago. Uh, so that seems like a massive waste of energy and time. Uh, also, all of these labs are massively underutilized. Um, I amused myself a handful of years ago by just counting what percentage of the time are my robots actually moving around. And I clocked in under 5% of the time. And my lab is active. And even in a highly active lab, more than 95% of the time, the robots are just sitting there being glorified overly expensive paperweights. So that doesn't seem right. So there are all sorts of other reasons why the way we are structuring our labs may not be the right way, uh, not just a matter of barrier to entry. So long story short is uh, we set out to solve this problem. And uh, the, the overarching vision, the idea was, let's build a, an open, remotely accessible swarm robotics test bed that people from all over the world could access, upload their code on, and basically test their ideas. Uh, so I went to uh, the National Science Foundation. Um, they have a program called MRI, which stands for Major Research Instrumentation. So I went to NSF and uh, pitched this idea, and they, they liked it. And 
this picture here that you're seeing, this is literally the picture that was in my MRI proposal. And what it is, it's a, uh, well, it's the Vienna Chamber Orchestra's concert hall, first of all, with uh, some Harvard kilobots sprinkled on top and then some random you know, graphics that I found. And uh, this is really pushing the, the limit of my Photoshopping skills. So anyway, this is, we said, this is what we're gonna build. And we got the money and this is what we built. Actually, this was a prototype. Here is what we actually built. Uh, we did build a, I must say, rather visually stunning, uh, remotely accessible lab. And uh, it ended up going live in August, 2017. So it's been in operation almost three years. And uh, the first thing that happened, of course, August 22nd, when we went live is, so this is a quote from The Field of Dreams, which is a Kevin Costner movie that you may have seen or not. Uh, and the quote is, if you build it, they will come. In uh, remote access robotics, it's almost true. I just need to make one little modification, which is, if you build it, they will not come. In fact, that turns out that the history of robotics is littered with remotely accessible robots that no one ever used. Uh, so the biggest problem we had in the beginning was we had built this thing that looked really good, but no one was interested in using it. Uh, so I spent a lot of time initially calling my friends, begging them to use it. And uh, in the beginning, it was, it was kind of a slow uptake. Uh, the first users were basically my friends that I called in favors from. Uh, so Jorge Cortes at UC San Diego, I still owe him a lot because he was the first user of the Robotarium. And there, I at the end, basically said, please just give me some code that we can put on the, on the Robotarium. Uh, so that's how it started. But it slowly got more and more traction. And around, you know, month three or four or so, we started doing a whole lot of media around it before we really had the user base in place. In fact, we were on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. And this was quite exciting, actually, to see that the popular media got excited about the Robotarium almost before the researchers that were going to use it got excited. But the media, me begging, the Robotarium starting to actually pan out, all of a sudden, maybe six months after its launch, we started seeing tons of submissions. And the first thing that happened was people started breaking stuff because we wanted people to actually run things. So these are code that had been submitted. In the beginning, we went air and ground. And as you see, things are falling out of the air quite a bit. So lots of robots got broken in the beginning once we, uh, once we launched the Robotarium. And this was actually a problem for us. We wanted this to be broadly used. We wanted to allow anyone to upload code. We needed it to be a research instrument. And I should say already at this point, research is different from teaching. If you're building a teaching lab and you want to teach someone about PID control, right? Then you have three well-defined knobs, P, I, and D, and then you let people tweak those knobs and that's it. You're over-constraining the system and that's the only thing you allow people to do. In research, you have to allow it to be open. You have to let it be flexible. Also, when you have an idea and you test it, Finding out that that idea was not a good idea is oftentimes as useful as finding out that it was a good idea. So we have to allow for people's code to be bad. We have to allow for lots of flexibility. And this became a problem. And in fact, a lot of the problems, uh, let me see here, there we go. A lot of the problems had to do, of course, with uh, things colliding, uh, colliding with each other, colliding with the boundary of the arena. So we needed to do some kind of rudimentary safety verification steps in there uh, having to do with collision avoidance. And uh, this, of course, is old. Collision avoidance is as old as autonomous robotics, right? And in fact, the first thing you do when you're a new robotic student is you write a, a collision avoidance or a, an obstacle avoidance routine. Uh, here's, by the way, a picture of, I still think it's my favorite uh, uh, collision, uh, autonomous robot collision. These are, uh, this is MIT's self-driving car in the DARPA 2007 urban driving competition colliding with Cornell's self-driving car and uh, Mark Campbell and uh, John Leonard are still arguing to this day who's at fault. I don't know. I just think it's a little amusing to see. 
Uh, we also had, by the way, a beautiful, beautiful car in the, the Urban Challenge. Uh, and we did really, really well. We made it to the, the semifinals. We were performing, I think, quite admirably until we didn't. So here's our, our car. It's a Porsche Cayenne. I don't know if you could hear that, but that's a horrifying sound of, of robots colliding. So point being, collisions are bad. Now, luckily for us, if you go to Google Scholar and you look for collisions, uh, you end up with quite a few hits. So this was maybe four or five months ago. There are 323,000 papers or hits on collision avoidance. And, 118,000 hits on obstacle avoidance, and none of them worked. We didn't try all of them, but they were inappropriate for what we needed to do in the Robotarium. Uh, and in particular, we had a special setup that made our lives different. Right? So the first thing that was fundamentally different in the Robotarium from almost any other application is the robot density is really, really, really large. Uh, what that means is that if you use a standard kind of collision avoidance routine where you have a force that goes like one over the distance squared, you know, Leonard Jones type binding potential uh, ideas, then uh, that force becomes too large when robots get too close and you can't pack enough robots together. So the density is high. The other thing that we've got going for us that's different is our agents are actually allowed to, to collaborate. Virtually all of collision avoidance is dealt with or deals with the following problem. If the other robot is going to do whatever it does, what do I do to be safe? But all of a sudden, we're in a situation where we're allowing the robots to kind of help each other out to avoid collisions. Uh, so that's the second thing that's different. The third thing that's different is we really don't know what it is that the robots are trying to do. A lot of times you can be smart when it comes to collision avoidance if you know what the goal of the robot is, but we don't. Someone uploaded code and ran something on the Robotarium. We don't know what this is trying to do. So what we have to do is we have to deal with high robot densities, robots that are actually able to collaborate, and where we don't know what the overarching objective is. And the way we solved this was with, with barrier certificates. Uh, and in particular, uh, so here is, instead of math, here is what we're saying that we're doing. What we're taking is we're looking at the, the actual control input generated by the user at any given point in time. And we're trying to get as close to that uh, control input with the actual con control input uh, subject to a do not collide constraint. And this do not collide constraint is a differential constraint uh, expressed in terms of the control signal. Uh, the details you can find now, it's, it's uh, based on these barrier control barrier functions that are you know, relatives to control the up on a functions, but it allows us to be minimally invasive in a very particular uh, mathematical sense, which means make as little change to the control input as possible subject to don't collide. So with that uh, lined up, here's what it now looks like. So going back to this cartoon, this was actually an experiment where we're asking the robots to swap positions by driving through exactly the same point, which is, which is a car crash, right? And now with the, with the barrier functions, uh, we're modifying the controller. We're not telling them how they should solve it. All we're saying is, hey, make these changes if uh, collisions are, are imminent. And what I like about it is that it looks almost right. It looks natural. A lot of times you look at robotic algorithms and you go, eh, yeah, kind of. This feels right. And it's exciting that they're, I say, as an ensemble, figuring out, in this case, they should rotate clockwise. In the other case, they did counterclockwise. And it works because they are collaborative. And it works uh, because it's minimally invasive. It also works even if some agents are not uh, collaborating. So here we have a big robot that just goes, no, I'm not moving. And the little ones have to run away to not get uh, run over. Uh, but the beauty of this is it's still safe, even though it's no longer minimally invasive. So we put that on the Robotarium. Uh, we also did the same thing in the air. So we have uh, these quads that we saw falling out of the air. Uh, there, we put barrier functions around them. Uh, it's not just collisions in this case. Uh, so here in the example, we have four robots flying in a spiral or a circle. And 
Li Wang, one of my students, is taking one of the robots and dragging it through the spiral without the robots colliding. And again, the user is actually trying to drag the robot through the, the spiraling robots and the barrier functions actually uh, uh, prevent them from, from colliding. So this is now running in the background. So here is on the actual robotarium, 35 robots, and they are asked to do this experiment where they're supposed to go through the same point in the middle of the arena. So this is a massive robotic car crash. And here is where the barrier functions kick in. And they figure out that the right way to manage this is by this spiraling motion. Uh, and we don't tell them what to do. All we're saying is here's the constraint that needs to be satisfied by the actual controller. Uh, so this took care of a lot of our safety problems. Um, so right now, if you upload code in the Robotarium, you're going to be running it with this unless you can convince us in simulation or by pestering us via email that what you're doing is actually, is actually safe. Uh, I'm having some issues. So here are some of the very early uh, experiments that, that were run on the Robotarium uh, with these kinds of barrier functions. This was on the, the prototype version, the tabletop. Uh, one was uh, Mark Spong doing some kind of formation controllers uh, out of uh, University of Texas, Dallas. Uh, Seth Hutchinson was doing fault tolerant rendezvous. Uh, and uh, uh, Masayuki Fujita from Tokyo Tech was doing attitude synchronization. But the point here is more that with these little tweaks, we could allow and open up a lot of different types of experiments without having to worry about people breaking stuff. So having said that, here is how it actually works right now. Uh, so you go to the Robotarium website. Um, I'll, the link comes in a bit. It's robotarium.gatech.edu. Uh, and the first thing you do is you register as a user. Then you can download the simulator, and you run your code in the simulator. Hopefully, we have no way of checking, but hopefully. Uh, and when you're happy with your algorithms, you submit a simulation script. So this is a code snippet, uh, and it's a little bit of a, an experiment description. We do some rudimentary checks on the code just for making sure that you know, there are no weird runtime errors and there are no, no other nebulous things happening. And then it gets placed in a queue. It's a first in, first out queue. So when the Robotarium is ready, we're pulling it from the queue. It's automatically being generated. Uh, the robots do their thing. They return to the charging stations. And the user that submitted the code gets the data and the video feed and whatever, whatever other sensor measurements they, they wanted back. And uh, the reason I think I'm at a session about uh, sponsored by MATLAB has to do with the fact that we ended up going MATLAB in the Robotarium. Um, in the interest of full disclosure, when we started, we thought we weren't. We thought that what we were building was something that's going to run ROS, the robotic operating system, because that seems more natural uh, by tapping into what's going on. But it turned out that a lot of our users, our early users, they're you know, control theoreticians that like to uh, program in MATLAB. They were, we ended up having quite a few uh, biologists studying social insects. Uh, we had social scientists. We had applied mathematicians. They don't want to hack in C++, but they do know how to use, use MATLAB. So the way you upload code is MATLAB scripts. And in fact, here is what it would look like. This is a submission process. So I'm not really expecting anyone to, to read this, but you do things like you set the number of robots. Uh, in this case, you have an experiment with 20. Uh, you initiate the object. Uh, you explain how long the experiment is going to be running, how many iterations. and then you know, you get the positions or the poses of the robots. These are differential drive robots, so they're uh, non-holonomic. The, the default positions are x, y, and theta. Uh, if you want to run them as single integrators, you can convert to single integrator dynamics. Then you have to have some main code. And then uh, at the end, you basically return the velocities. So it's as simple as that. And here is a an example of what the ma main code might look like. Uh, so this is a, a consensus equation. All you're saying is, you know what? Let's get the topology. So you can, you can specify different kinds of topologies if you want to do this graph or a fixed topology, what that should look like. And then 
you basically specify the velocities. And here, this is the standard linear average consensus equation. And that's what gets then uh, submitted onto the, the actual robots. So having said that, like I said, in the beginning, I had to basically lie, cheat, and steal and beg users to, uh, to show up and start, start using them. Uh, since August 2017, so this is now almost up to, uh, to uh, 3, 000, sorry, to three years, we've had over 1,000 distinct users. So these are now people that have signed up with an account. Uh, and we have actually way more experiments uh, than, we have, than we have users. Uh, and this is quite exciting. We have a lot of repeat customers. It also turns out that 40% of the users never actually run an experiment. And we've tried to kind of understand why that is. Uh, a lot of them only use the simulator because we have a simulator that's, again, in MATLAB. Uh, and that's something that people enjoy getting access to. Uh, we've also learned that a lot of the users are working in teams. So 10 people sign up, but one person is the only person that actually submits code. Uh, so but anyway, across these uh, 1,200, it's a little bit more actually now, uh, distinct users, uh, here's what the geography looks like. So these are the registered users. So these are relative, so these are fractions. North America has uh, uh, over 50% are, are the US and Canada. Uh, Asia is second and Europe is third. Um, maybe not overly surprising. But then I was very happy that we have users from South America. We have users from, from Australia or Oceania. Uh, we have users from Africa. Uh, in fact, we have users from every continent except Antarctica. So if there's anyone listening to this right now who happens to run a research lab in Antarctica, please go and, and upload code on the Robotarium so I can say we have users from every continent, which, which we don't right now. Uh, another thing that's interesting, though, talking about the users is if you don't look at the registered users, but the actual experiments that are being executed, then there are more from, from the US and Canada, more from North America that are, that are submitting things. Uh, Asia is now number three, and Europe has overtaken Asia in terms of the number of submissions. Uh, and there, it seems like pe people are really using the simulator more than anything else. Uh, and to me, that's, it, it's a little interesting that just being able to provide a, a reasonably good uh, simulator for large teams of robots has uh, proven to be, uh, to be engaging. The other thing that we've looked at are what kinds of things are people interested in? Uh, so these are the topics that are associated with the experiment. So when you submit an experiment, you have to basically say roughly what it's about. Uh, you could you know, put a blank space in there. That works, but people don't. People are being nice. Uh, so a lot of them are class projects. Even though we did not set out to design a teaching instrument, uh, we set out to design a research instrument, but people are using them uh, a lot in, in classes. And then there are things like formation control, path planning, leader follower, coverage control, consensus, blocking and swarming, collision avoidance, task assignment, connectivity maintenance. So these are all topics that you can find all over ACC. So it turns out that the kinds of multi-agent system stuff that we as a community are interested in are indeed what people are putting on the Robotarium. Uh, the other thing that we've been quite excited about is we just hit our 100 mark in terms of peer-reviewed papers, not from our group that uses the Robotarium as the, as the experiment platform. And here is what the papers are about uh, if you squint. And again, could be, could be uh, ACC. So the fact that we've generated 100 plus peer-reviewed papers out of the Robotarium, not with us, the Georgia Tech team as, as authors is, is fantastic. I'm really, really happy about, about that. So having said that, uh, there are a few things that we've learned about remote access research along the line. Right? One is this question of security. Um, there is a physical security that we solved with these control barrier functions, but there's also a cyber uh, security question. Um, we're literally giving people access to physical things on Georgia Tech's campus and uh, Georgia Tech's OIT, Office of Information Technology, they're in a constant state of nervousness around this because we have been, there have been multiple cyber attacks on the Robotarium. Uh, 
And this goes back to this tension between research and education. If you're building an educational test bed, if this is an instructional lab, then you can constrain it so that the constraints are rather tight and the only thing you can really ask of this system are the things you're interested in in your educational module. That's not how research works. You have to allow strange stuff to happen. You have to allow failed experiments. And in fact, one thing we realized very quickly is that if we can imagine what people are going to do with a robotarium, then it's probably not worthwhile. It's the stuff that we cannot imagine that really, really matters. Uh, so that's something that we've, uh, we're still kind of struggling with a little bit in, in how do we make it maximally flexible. So right now, for instance, we have an overhead projector that allows people to project down scenes in the robotarium. So instead of dragging out obstacles, uh, we have a central computer that hallucinates the obstacles and tells the, the robots what they would see if they actually had sensors that could pick up these obstacles. So we've seen, we've seen ant, ant hives, we've seen you know, road networks and traffic, we've seen a lot of urban uh, environments with buildings, we've seen farm fields, so corn rows. Uh, so we've seen quite a bit of different kinds of, of scenes that people are projecting into the, into the robotarium. Uh, the one thing that's hard about this that I'm, I'm constantly worrying about is the funding model. So you can find money to start something like this. And I, I went uh, the MRI route, then I got what's called the DURIP. Uh, so this is uh, instrumentation funds from, from ONR, the Office of Naval Research. But that's not maintenance money, right? Uh, and to me, it is very, very important that the cost of running the ro using the robotarium is free. The whole point is, there should be no barriers to entry here. So it has to be free, but it's hard to run a business on free. Uh, and over the last year, year and a half, we've discovered that companies, for-profit companies are using the robotarium. So we're now standing up a model where, you know what, if you're a company and you make money off what you're doing in the robotarium, you should probably pay something. Uh, the other thing we're also discovering or, uh, or that's happening is people are raising money. They're writing grant proposals where they're proposing to use the robotarium as the platform. And then we're trying to make sure that there is some way of putting in robotarium support also in, in other people's grant proposals as a way of, of funding it. But this is a problem. So right now it's being funded by me building robotarium into whatever grant proposals I write. Uh, but, but that's not a, a, a long-term uh, solution to this. And, it turns out that this is not unique to the robotarium. There is a, a out of Rutgers University, a, a very long established wireless networking remote access lab. And they have exactly the same problem, which is you can find the funds to build it up, but how do you maintain it over, over the decades? And this is something that, that is tricky. Uh, okay. I said I was going to spend just a little bit of time talking about what happened uh, during the, the pandemic. So this is the monthly usage numbers starting in August 2017. Uh, and uh, one thing that was interesting is in the middle of March when uh, we were at Jordan Tech sent home and you know, we were sent home all over the world, uh, we were allowed to maintain critical activity. So these were research activities focused explicitly on COVID-19 rapid response research. It was things like you know, stuff that would blow up if you didn't have someone in there or experiments that have been running for six months and you needed two more weeks to get the final data. So things like that. Well, the robotarium was deemed a critical activity because it helped researchers all over the world uh, actually when, after they went home. So what we did is we kept it running throughout the shelter at home uh, phase that were, that were still to some degree across the, the globe in. Uh, but anyway, if you look at the data, right, the first six months, like I said, were miserable. Uh, the first peak was really me begging people to use it. But then it started to uh, pick up. And uh, it's interesting how bursty the data is. And we actually went back and tried to figure out what was going on. And a lot of these peaks coincide either with IRAS or ICRA deadlines. These are the two main robotics conferences where we're seeing a huge uptick in usage. And then a few known large class projects that also correspond to, uh, to peaks. Uh, but what I particularly want to point out here is after people went home mid-March of this year, uh, we've seen usage grow and grow and grow and grow. And this is really, really quite promising. I think uh, 
even though we set out to build something to democratize access, what we really built is a way for people to keep running experiments, even though they have to shelter at home during a, a pandemic crisis. So to me, this is also, this is a side effect that we didn't certainly didn't expect, but it is, I think, very, very uh, exciting. Um, Having said that, I have started to talk about making lemonade now in the age of, of the coronavirus. And what I mean by that is we've all been handed a big, fat, sour pandemic lemon. Uh, and what are things that we can actually do that is positive around this uh, to make lemonade, if you, if you will? Uh, so one thing that we've seen that I already talked about, lots of submissions since we started the shelter at home phase. Uh, other things that I think are very positive that have not happened just during the pandemic, but also earlier is we've seen labs start to federate. So there is, here's an example, for instance, of researchers at Tokyo Tech in, in Tokyo across 11,000 kilometers and a 400 milliseconds communication delay round trip, coordinating robots in the robotarium with their robots. So the fact that you have robots in Tokyo and robots in Atlanta doing things together in a coordinated fashion is fantastic because it allows us to expand the reach and the footprint. So if everyone has one robot, then all of a sudden we can federate them together and get to how many robots we may need. And yeah, it's running in my living room and in your living room. Uh, so that's cool. Um, there are also a lot of lessons that we've learned that uh, we have helped transition to other labs. So these are other robotics labs. Uh, so this is a picture from the the Ducky Town at ETH in, uh, in Zurich, uh, they have a Ducky Town Robotarium, which is a remotely accessible version. It's, it says Robotarium Watchtower Camera Feed. Uh, it's not our Robotarium, it's their Robotarium. There is a Robotarium Paraguay that's come online and then stopped being online. Uh, I hope it's coming back. Uh, there's a Robotarium West. Uh, Kennedy Space Center is, is talking about standing up a Robotarium. So, there are other robotariums being built, and if you could federate them together, I think that would be spectacular. I'm also excited to see things happening in other domains. So I know for a fact that uh, Sonia Martinez, for instance, at UC San Diego is, is building a uh, distributed energy version, or at least plotting to build a distributed energy version uh, based on similar types of, of principles. There are lots of cybersecurity and cyber physical security labs now that have popped up that use these kinds of principles. Uh, this is all great, but from my point of view, the number one thing that makes me the most happy about the Robotarium is that I think we have succeeded in democratizing access to a world-class robotics lab. The fact that the demographics look the way they do, both in terms of geographical spread, but also who the people are, uh, really is, is exciting. And you can say, yeah, yeah, but you only had 10 people from Africa, but you know what? 10 is strictly greater than zero. And I am really, really happy with that. Uh, something to build with. We haven't actually torn down the barriers to entry, but we certainly made them, uh, made them less tall. We've had Girl Scout troops run experiments. We have had quite a few public high schools, like I said, labs in Africa and South America. Uh, next week, there's a robotics hackathon in Nepal that's uh, about to happen in the robotarium. That's cool. So to me, these are, these are things I actually want to take with me uh, as, as success stories. So with that, I want to say thank you.